Uh, today we are talking, uh, the first in two classes, looking at Paul the Apostle and the Pauline Epistles. Now I've already had people say, wait a minute, Galatians, that's not till next week. Um, I made a change here, and I told you all along I have reserved the right to make changes. The, 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 what I've done is, as I looked at this, it's easier to talk about the history and the development of Pauline theology and actually of Paul's history overall if we take his letters in the order in which he wrote them rather than the order in which they're in the Bible. So the original reading list, and it's okay if you read, you know, if you read the Pauline letters that I asked you to for this week and we're not dealing with those, you'll get them all done by next week, okay? It'll be all right. Yeah, right. But, uh, <laughs> so this week what I want to do is to spend some time talking about Paul and his life and his history, and then deal with the first five books that he wrote, Galatians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, and 1st and 2nd Corinthians, in that order. Now, I'll talk about as we go along, there is some dispute among scholars as to whether Galatians was first or the Thessalonian letters were first, but I believe it was the Galatian letters. I, I fall on that side. I'm, on the, I'm a southern Galatian guy, and I'll explain what that means in a few minutes. Uh, there is, there's a difference in terms of um, what Galatia refers to, and that would make a difference in terms of when they were, the letter was written. Whether, but it was, at, it was either Galatians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, or it was 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, Galatians. We still know those were the earliest of his letters. Um, it's very possible that Galatians, as I've said before, is either the first letter, the first uh, book written of the New Testament, or else it was second. I tend to think the book of James was first, by just a nose. And then after the book of James was written by James, the half-brother of Jesus, and then Galatians came out right after that. Because those two really do uh, complement each other. They are two halves of the equation of what it means to be a believer in Jesus, um, which we'll get into a little bit more in our Friday Bible study this next week. Okay. Um, so today we're going to look at Paul and Pauline epistles, Galatians 1st and 2nd Thessalonians 1st and 2nd Corinthians. Next week we'll deal with starting out the... Uh, you know, the magnum opus, the big book, the most significant theological book in the New Testament in terms of development of theology of the Christian faith, which is Romans, Philemon, Colossians, Ephesians, Philippians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, and Titus. Um, and then we'll go on from there to the, the uh, and then we'll be almost done um, with the rest of the, the New Testament. Uh, some images, I want to show these to you because, as you can see, um, Paul is a handsome man. Um, <laughs> He's always, he's always presented as being either bald or mostly bald. Um, the images that we have up here, this one I took at the Church of St. Savior of Cora in Istanbul. Um, and it's a mosaic of Paul, and you'll notice, you know, he's a smooth man. <laughs> uh, my brother Esau was a hairy man, but I, I am a smooth man. <laughs> the, and then uh, this one I took... Um, from a chapel, it's the chapel of Lydia, in, uh, right next to Philippi. Um, Lydia was a Gentile woman that Paul, that converted and Paul baptized. There's now a chapel there, there's a place, a stream, where supposedly she was baptized. And so this is Timothy and Paul and Luke, um, a wonderful mosaic of the three of them. And you'll notice Luke is writing, writing, writing all the time. Um, then this is just from the internet, but it's another image of, of Paul. You get, we, we have, there are no photographs left of Paul. Um, <laughs> and yet we have descriptions of him in the traditions that are always pretty consistent. As you can see, you know, they're, they're fairly, fairly consistent in terms of how he's presented. So let's talk about Paul the Apostle and his life, okay? Um, I'll leave it there for a minute. Paul was born right about the same time, we believe, as Jesus uh, was born, somewhere around A.D. 654, somewhere right in there. We believe that he probably died about A.D. 67, which means that um, he, uh, he lived to be a pretty good age for those days. I mean, to live into your uh, 50s and 60s was considered quite old in that time, especially because he had a pretty pretty rigorous life. A lot of traveling, a lot of, you know, a lot of beatings, and a lot of other things. And so he actually did pretty well. He died as a martyr, we believe, in Rome. Um, he's considered, most certainly, the second most influential person in the Christian faith after, guess who? <laughs> Jesus. In fact, a few years ago, it's interesting, a, a lot of liberal scholars say that Christianity was invented by Paul. 
that what Paul came up with is his theology that became Christianity as we know it was not what Jesus intended. And so every, every year they do a, an estimate of the most important people in history, and sometimes it changes. And for several years, the most important person in history was St. Paul. It wasn't Jesus. Because they, again, liberal scholars believe he kind of invented Christianity. We do not believe that. We believe that the Holy Spirit guided Paul to, to articulate the particulars of the faith, filling in the details, as Jesus had sort of outlined it in his life. But again, we still have to recognize that he is so, so significant and important in the development of the Christian faith. We can't imagine what Christianity would be without it. God could have had some other plan, but that's not how uh, he chose to do it. Paul is the author of 13 of the 27 books of the New Testament, so almost half of them. Now again, liberal scholars, there are six of those books that liberal scholars claim they don't think that Paul wrote. There are seven of those 13 that are pretty much universally considered uh, Pauline. I'll get into that a little bit as we go into it. I want to give you just kind of an overview. Um, although Paul wrote 13 of the 27 books, he, did, he actually didn't contribute the most words to the New Testament. Um, Luke, with the Gospel of Luke, which is the longest gospel, and the book of Acts, which is a substantial book, uh, he actually has more words. So Luke wrote more, even though he only has two books, than the 13 books of Paul. Because some of Paul's books are quite short. Um, Romans being the long one. And I've told you that before. The reason why I, we're doing Galatians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, because they're the first books he wrote. The reason they're not in order in the New Testament like that is because in the Bible they put the longest books first. So when they come to uh, Paul's letters, they put Romans first, because it's the longest. Theologically, it's probably the most significant. It's the most general theologically. But then it works its way down to Philemon, which is a little bit of a tiny short book, uh, when in fact that's not at all the order they were written in. So we're going to look at them chronologically so that we can look at the history. Um, Paul, his significance to Christianity is not only that he wrote 13 of the 27 books in the New Testament, he also was responsible, probably more than any other single person, for spreading Christianity throughout the Roman world at that time. We're going to look at some maps and you can see the, the range of his travel. In fact, there is a very strong tradition, and uh, I believe it's likely, that Paul ended up going all the way to Spain. And there's some tradition that he went all the way to Great Britain in his fourth missionary journey. Uh, there's a period of time in which we don't have any writings and we don't have any any biblical um, record like we do from his earlier travels and whatnot, but there's very strong tradition and there's a reference in Romans, for instance, that Paul says, when, I, when, I'm, when I'm on my way to Spain, I will stop by and see you. And so we know it was his intention to go to Spain and tradition is that he actually did make that from some, some and again, we'll get into that, I'm just giving you an overview here. Paul was a native of the Mediterranean city of Tarsus which was the capital of Cilicia. Cilicia was the, uh, the a Roman province just on the northeastern corner of the Mediterranean Sea. If I mean. Go ahead and do this because you can sort of get an idea. Uh, you see Cilicia up there, and you see Tarsus. This is Tarsus. That's where Paul was from. That's where he was born. This is the Roman province of Cilicia, Syria. This is uh, Palestine. This is Israel right down here, okay? So you get some, some perspective. Um, Tarsus, the city that Paul was from, was very well known for being an intellectual environment. In fact, um, it was said that the intellectuals from Tarsus were valued in Alexandria and a lot of other places because it was a center for Stoic philosophy, but the, uh, the university there was known for teaching strongly in uh, history and literature and rhetoric. You know, they used to study things like logic and rhetoric were part of a basic education. Rhetoric is, you know, the how you communicate, it's, it's speech, it's you know how you talk, uh, and it used to be a big deal uh, to, to train people in rhetoric. We see some of the evidence of that in some of Paul's writings, his ability to communicate messages. Um, while he was from Tarsus, and, and in the days of Alexander the Great, Tarsus was considered the most important city in all of Asia Minor, all of what we currently know as, as Turkey. So it was a very significant city. In fact, Paul at one point says he's from Tarsus, no mean city, which means we're not, talking to, we're not talking a minor city here, we're talking a city of some significance. So Tarsus was quite important. Um, it was one of the largest trade centers on the whole uh, Mediterranean coast. The, uh, anybody who came from there was going to be well educated. Now Paul came from there, but as a young man, a uh, very young man, probably more teen oriented, uh, he would have been sent, probably earlier than that even, 
to Jerusalem. We know that he was trained in Jerusalem. He was trained by Gamaliel. Gamaliel was a Jewish um, teacher and leader and scholar who had his own school. In fact, Gamaliel was the grandson of Hillel. Hillel was one of the greatest of the uh, rabbis in all Jewish history. Gamaliel ranks right up there as well. Gamaliel during the time of Paul and New Testament, and Gamaliel is mentioned in the New Testament. In the book of Acts, it's Gamaliel who tells the Sanhedrin, the Jewish uh, court, that they should leave uh, Peter and John and the apostles alone because they had examples before where people who claimed to be Messiah or claimed to have a message from God that didn't, it all sort of caved in on itself and and was no more. And he said, if that's if this is just a bunch of guys making this up, then they'll die out too. But if this truly is from God, then who are we to try to stop it? You know, great wisdom. So we have that from Gamaliel in the book of Acts. But Gamaliel was the the lead uh, scholar. He was the the uh, what would you call it? President, the uh, provost, the you know of the school of Hillel. It had been passed down from his grandfather. And it was very well known for giving a really balanced education. It wasn't just the Jewish law. They also taught their students classical literature, philosophy, ethics, things of that sort. So it was a very strong sort of classical Greek education in addition to the Jewish law. Although it was all, all Jewish. So you see that Paul came from Tarsus, a city where even as a child he would have gotten a really good education because they were so proud of being a city where everyone was well educated. Being a young Jewish man, you know, uh, he would have gotten a general education anyway. They were all, all Jewish men could read and write. It was part of their, their upbringing. But then Paul ended up, when he, before he was Paul, when he was still Saul of Tarsus, he ended up in the school of Gamaliel and um, became a significant scholar. Just the fact that he studied with Gamaliel was quite something. Um, it's probable that not just Paul, but other members of his family actually moved to Jerusalem as well, because we have an example in Acts 23 where his nephew lives in Jerusalem, and his nephew finds out about a plot to kill Paul and comes and tells the Romans about it. The Roman guards uh, actually tells he, tell, he tells Paul, and Paul says, go in and tell the centurion, the guy in charge here, what you just told me. And they end up sneaking Paul out of town, so he's not going to be assassinated. So we do know that Paul had other relatives living in Jerusalem at that time. We also, there's a reference later on to the fact that his mother apparently was living in Rome. Because when he writes to Rome, he refers to the fact that his mother was amongst the, the people uh, living there. So he was a very cosmopolitan kind of guy. Very well educated, um, of, of some significance. Now, he was a Pharisee. We always think of Pharisee as being, you know, bad. But in fact, in initially, the Pharisees were those who were truly committed to a sincere belief in the Jewish faith and in the Jewish, uh, the Jewish law, the Torah. Um, and so to be a Pharisee meant he was very serious about his faith. He calls himself at one point a Pharisee, a son of a Pharisee. So his father would have been a part of the Pharisaical movement. And that's not, it simply meant that you, you, um, you chose that following. All right? it, it's, uh, it's like a almost like a political affiliation. You know, you choose to join because you, you believe what they believe in. The, the, the Pharisees, as opposed to the Sadducees, they had some different theological belief. We've talked about that, I believe, before. And we don't know how, but Paul also, not only was his father a Pharisee, but because of his father, or his grandfather, or somewhere in that line, Paul was a Roman citizen. Now, a person could become a Roman citizen um, several ways. Either your father was a Roman citizen, and so you inherit it, or you did some significant service to the Roman Empire and it was granted to you by somebody of significance, or you could purchase it. And if you purchased it, it was very expensive. In fact, again, that centurion I just mentioned in the book of Acts, when Paul tells him, I'm a Roman citizen, and he said, well, I'm a Roman citizen, and it cost me a, a lot of money to become a Roman citizen. And Paul said, well, I was born a Roman citizen, which means I, his father or his grandfather somewhere along his line, since they were Jewish, they had been they had been granted or had purchased or whatever Jewish citizenship. And that made a huge difference in terms of how Paul was treated by the Roman authorities. He had he had a right not to be beaten without being tried, which is what he what he claimed when he was arrested in Jerusalem. Actually he the Romans kind of saved him from being killed by a Jewish crowd and then said he was under arrest and they said, well let's flog him and Jesus said or uh, 
Paul said, are you in the habit of flogging Roman citizens without a trial? And it scared the centurion, because that was a serious mistake. And Paul then later declares that he appeals to Rome, which he had a right to do as a Roman citizen. You could appeal, sort of like appealing to the Supreme Court. If you were a citizen, you had that right. If you weren't a Roman citizen, then you had very little rights in the Roman Empire. But Paul was a citizen, which is because he was a citizen, that's why tradition has it that when he, when he was killed, when he was martyred, he was beheaded, which is the way a Roman citizen was to be killed. Peter, on the other hand, was crucified. And instead, uh, Peter requested to be crucified upside down, so that because he did not feel worthy to be crucified in the same manner as Jesus, his Lord. But Peter was crucified, which was considered, um, it was a horrendous way to go, but it was also considered a horrible shame to be crucified. So no Roman citizen was ever allowed to be crucified. Um, so, back to Paul. Paul claimed um, in Philippians that he was of uh, the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, circumcised on the eighth day, as of the law, a Pharisee. Um, he says then in Acts, he later, at a different time, he said he was a Pharisee, son of a Pharisee. He is very proud of his heritage, but also apologetic for the fact that it led him to persecute the church, which we'll talk about. When the, the Christian church first started growing, and this was when Paul was still Saul, his original name was Saul of Tarsus, he, uh, because he was so enthusiastic for his faith, because he was so much um, a defender of what he thought was the true faith, the Jewish faith, when the Christian sect of Judaism, and they were all Jews at first, started to grow, there was a movement within Judaism to suppress it violently. And Paul, who was then Saul, was one of the primary ones of those. We know very little about him. Uh, between being a student of Gamaliel, and he appears at the stoning of Stephen. Stephen, the first martyr to the Christian faith, in Acts 7, um, we have, uh, Stephen was one of the deacons that was appointed. The only two deacons, we know there are all of their names, they were appointed to help care for the needs of the people, so that the apostles could focus on preaching and teaching, uh, and prayer. The deacons, Philip and Stephen are the two that we hear anything about. Philip becomes Philip the Evangelist, and we have a number of stories about him traveling and the Ethiopian eunuch and various other things in the book of Acts. Stephen, in Acts 7, is re recognized as a great man of faith, a man full of the Holy Spirit, a great teacher, um, and he is confronted by these Jewish zealots, and he testifies to them of the Messiahship of Jesus in his wonderful sermon that he gives, at the end of which the Jews are infuriated at him and stone him to death. And he see, has a vision of Jesus standing at the right hand of God the Father while he's being killed. Saul, later to become Paul, was there witnessing all of this and maybe even have been part of instigating it. And he takes care of everybody's cloaks. He holds their, their cloaks while they're all stoning Stephen. From that point on, he goes out, and apparently Saul got the Sanhedrin to kind of commission him to go out and persecute these followers of this Jesus who claimed to be the Christ. And he later on confesses that he had persecuted the church of God beyond measure prior to his conversion. In fact, he's so zealous that he gets the Sanhedrin to give him papers for him to go to Damascus, which is a city in Syria, the largest, well, the first city of significance north of Jerusalem, uh, to try to gather up any of the Jewish people who have begun, become followers of this way, as it was called then, as he says in Acts 22, to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. Well, of course, while he is on the road to Damascus, and that Damascus road has become a, um, a, a symbol for a massive change, some radical turnaround. While he is on the road to Damascus, Paul hears and sees the resurrected Christ. He is stricken by this bright light. He has knocked off of his ride. Apparently he's on a mule. Stricken blind, and he hears a voice say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he says, who are you, Lord? Smart enough to put the Lord in there. <laughs> and the voice says, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city. You will be told what you must do. He is stricken blind. He has to be led into the city of Damascus. So this is Jerusalem. This is trip 
bing, right there. I mean, somewhere along here. And then Damascus. He goes into Damascus. He is blind. The Holy Spirit uh, sends word to a Christian Jew there named Ananias, Ananias of Damascus, that there is a man who is in a house on the street called Straight, which still exists in Damascus. There is still the Straight Street in Damascus. And so uh, Ananias, obedient to God, goes to Paul, who's still called Saul at this point. I keep using both names. And Ananias is a little concerned at first because he, he's already heard that Saul is the one persecuting the Jewish believers. But he goes to him, he tells, he sort of witnesses to Saul, explains what's happened to him, and he heals him, lays hands on him, Saul is given back his sight, and he is convinced that this really was the Jesus that he was persecuting, or whose followers he was persecuting. He then spends some time in Arabia. We don't have any real details about that, but he did go off into the desert. There's one tradition that said he actually went to Mount Sinai, which is where the law was given to Moses, and then he prayed there, but he spent some time uh, off by himself. Um, he then returns back to Damascus, and from, from that time on, Paul, um, and somewhere in here, his name gets changed to Paul, that's traditional and throughout, throughout Scripture, and in fact throughout history, significant changes, especially spiritual changes to somebody, led to a change in name. Simon became Peter, Abram became Abraham, Sarai became Sarah, um, Saul became Paul. Okay. So he becomes Paul, he is in Damascus, he still doesn't quite know what he's going to do with himself, um, and he's approached by Barnabas. Barnabas, the son of encouragement, one of the most respected and most beloved of all of the followers of Jesus. He approaches him, and uh, he finds him and takes him up to Antioch, which is up here. Now, those of you who remember the history, uh, Antiochus was the, the, one of the names of the kings of the Seleucid Empire that controlled all of this area at one time. Well, he planted a couple of cities. Antiochus, being the king, planted cities named Antioch. There's Antioch in Syria, which is what this is. There's also, over here somewhere, uh, Pisidian Antioch, because it's in the region known as Pisidia. So there's a couple of fairly large cities named Antioch. Um, Barnabas gets Paul, takes him back to Antioch. There's a famine that occurs in Judea, and there's a church that gets planted in Antioch, partly because of Barnabas. Others have come up there. Um, they, the first church that had real Gentile believers in it was in Antioch. Um, the, from Antioch, here, Paul and Barnabas feel a call of God to go out and share the good news of Jesus to other parts of the Mediterranean, Eastern Mediterranean world that had not yet heard about him. And so we have the first of Paul's uh, journeys, the first of his missionary journeys. Paul and Barnabas leave out from Antioch, and they go first to Cyprus. Barnabas was from Cyprus, so they go to Cyprus, and at this point, up to this point, Barnabas was considered the lead. It's always Barnabas and Paul. When they get to Cyprus, a number of things of significance happen. They begin to preach. Particularly, they're confronted by a magician named Elimus, uh, who criticizes their teaching, and Paul rebukes him and strikes him blind. From that point on, it's no longer Barnabas and Paul, it's Paul and Barnabas. And Paul becomes the leader, whereas previously it had clearly been Barnabas. Accompanying them on this trip uh, here is John Mark, who is a cousin of Barnabas. When they leave Paphos, um, uh, on Cyprus and go to Italia, which is one of the cities our cruise is going to go to in October if you'd like to go along. Um, and to Italia, there, uh, John Mark decides to leave and go back to Jerusalem. And Paul is very disappointed in him. In fact, later on, Paul and Barnabas have a dispute because of this thing. Uh, Barnabas wants to take John Mark, his cousin, on the second trip, the second missionary journey, and Paul refuses because he deserted them, as Paul calls it, the first time. Later on, uh, and, and they, they part ways on the second journey, we'll talk about. But John Mark ends up um, joining up with Peter and being secretary to Peter. 
In fact, the book of Mark is written by this same John Mark that had deserted Paul and Barnabas on the first missionary journey, became the secretary to Peter. And so the Gospel of Mark is very much the Gospel according to St. Peter, uh, we believe. So they travel from uh, Talia and Perga up into the area of Pisidia. You'll notice another city named Antioch of Pisidia, as opposed to Antioch of Syria. They plant churches in Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, Derbe, and then they come back the same way. All right? Except instead of coming to Cyprus, they leave from Italia and sail straight back to Antioch, and then down to Jerusalem. Okay? That's the first missionary journey. They planted churches along the way. They, uh, most of them were um, Gentile churches. There were Jewish believers as well, but these are all Gentile cities. This Asia Minor, this is what we know of as Turkey, uh, was, was, there were Jewish populations in most of the cities, but it was predominantly Gentile. So they, Paul, and Barnabas as well, but especially Paul, therefore was responsible for planting the gospel in churches in this area of Pisidia in Asia Minor. Okay. They come back, they go down to Jerusalem, and there's an event there called, well, there's a calling of the Jerusalem Council. The Jerusalem Council is recorded in Acts 15. And the Jerusalem Council was when, um, because Gentiles were beginning to become Christians, the question arose, well, do these Gentiles have to become Jews first? Do they have to be circumcised? Do they have to obey the rest of the laws of Moses? And Paul, having just planted all of these Gentile churches, feels pretty strongly about this. So he and Barnabas go down. Paul represents the fact that, no, you know, let us not try to create a burden that these Gentiles can't come to believe in Jesus as Messiah. They don't have to be Jews. So the Council of Jerusalem decides that. Um, and very significant, James, the half-brother of Jesus, who wrote the epistle of James in the New Testament, is the one who makes the declaration. The only thing they tell them is, you don't have to be circumcised or be a Jew to be saved, but we, we, would, we would recommend that you not do certain things, like don't, don't eat fl uh, animal flesh with blood still in it, and you know, don't eat uh, uh, food that's, that's been sacrificed to idols. Those were not things that were necessary for salvation. They were things that were necessary in order for the Jews not to be so offended that they wouldn't listen to you if you're trying to tell them about the Jesus that you believe in. Okay? So it was a witnessing question, not a salvation question. So after that, we have the, that's the first missionary journey in the Council of Jerusalem. We then have a second missionary journey. As I said, they started out in, in Jerusalem, went back up to Antioch, and there was a a, a dispute between Barnabas and Paul then over whether or not John Mark should go with them on this second trip. They disagreed. Barnabas takes John Mark and goes back to Cyprus, and that's the last we really hear of them until later. Paul refers to them later in their letters, both of them very affectionately. He had, had, had a problem with them, but they get over it, and they still really they care for each other. But Paul, at that point, takes with him Silas, and then later on, Luke, the physician, the Gentile physician, the writer of Luke and the book of Acts, joins them. But they head, instead of taking the sea route, they head across land through Cilicia. Uh, there's a, there are huge mountains right here. Uh, if, I think in your book there are pictures of these snow-capped mountains. There is one pass called the Gates of Cilicia that goes through those mountains. But it is still a very difficult trip over land. That's why people tended to go by sea. But Paul decides to go over land. They go through the gates of Cilicia. They go over. They visit the same places he'd gone to before. Derby, Lystra, Iconium. And then they work their way over here to the city of Troas. In Troas... But what would the approximate distance be between those two points? The whole length of the... Between Sicilia Turkey. and... The, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, that's the whole nation of Turkey. So we're probably looking at 1,000 miles. Wow. Pretty good distance. Yeah. Um, I'm guessing, it might not be that far, but it's, we'll look it up. It's, he's basically going from the, the eastern border of what's now the nation of Turkey to the western end of it. So, Very and extent. Turkey, Asia Minor, is a pretty extensive place. And there are mountains. There's not only mountains here, but there's also ridges of mountains along, along this area. So, it's, it's a pretty mountainous area. There are plateaus, there are valleys, but, you know, there are mountains to be crossed if you're going to go by land, especially in those days. When it didn't have highways, major highways, that kind of thing. Now, the Romans had put in some roads that connected them, but a lot of it was still cross-country stuff. So they go to Troas, and in Troas, Paul has a vision of a man in Macedonia. Macedonia is here. It's this, uh, what we know of as Greece today, and that day were several different sort of minor states. 
that were affiliated, Macedonia being up here in the north, an area that pre prior to this had been called Thrace at one time, Greece, the main body of it was called Achaia, and then down here, this was the Peloponnese. Um, so Paul has a vision of a man in Macedonia saying, come across and help us. So, and I should have brought that picture, I will when we talk about uh, the Philippians, because I have, there's an image in, uh, in one of the cities up here, actually, uh, Neapolis, which today is called, help me, Carolyn, or the Hansons, what's it called where we landed? Kavala. The city of Kavala, there's this beautiful, big uh, mosaic there of the vision Paul had of the man of Troas. Uh, and so they cross over here. This is Europe. This is Asia. Green Europe, brown Asia. So they cross over from Asia into Europe. They visit Philippi. And that's uh, right outside Philippi. It's, well, in, in Philippi, Paul is arrested, thrown into jail. Um, I'll bring some pictures when we look at Philippians about the a place that's traditionally his prison, you know, which still is, sort of stands there, except for those the jacks they have holding up the, the roof. Um, he in Philippi there was a woman who was possessed, who was uh, uh, made money for her her master. She was a slave girl, and she kept following around, uh, following them around, screaming about how they were servants of the Most High God, Jesus, you know, and all this. And they got tired of her doing that, so Paul rebuked her and drove out the spirit, and so she wasn't making money for her, her owners anymore, and. They press charges against Paul for ruining their economy, you know, and he gets thrown in jail for it. And that's when they're, he and Silas are miraculously released from jail. And uh, that's the conversion of the Philippi Philippian jailer, which is a famous story. Um, it's also from Troas, that's where Luke connects with them. And the reason we know that is because prior to Acts 16, it's all they. They went here, they did this. In Acts 16, Luke writing it. Start saying we. So we know where it was that Paul can, or Luke connected with them. They went across to Philippi, to Thessalonica, where they had a lot of trouble from the Jews in Thessalonica. They went on to Berea, and when they got to Berea, some of the Jews from Thessalonica followed them to give them trouble and to try to create problems for them. So Paul ended up taking a boat from Berea all the way down to Athens. This is when he preached on the Areopagus or Mars Hill. He met the philosophers of the Greek beliefs. And the famous story about how I see you're such religious people, and I see all of these different altars to all of these gods, including one I saw to the unknown god. The Greeks were wanting to make sure they didn't offend any gods because the Greeks believed that the, that the Greek, their gods love nothing better than to give humans a hard time just to see how they handle it. And so they didn't want the Greek gods to be offended, so they had one altar to the unknown god to cover all their bases. Paul said that is the right one. That's the true one. What you called the unknown God, is the one true God who sent his son, Jesus. Okay. From Athens, he went over to Corinth. And we're going to look at the Corinthian letters uh, a little bit later here. And uh, was involved in a the church there. He had a hearing with the, the local governor, Gallius. Um, and then from there, caught a boat back to Ephesus, where he spent some time. He had several visits to Ephesus. Ephesus became one of the most important locations of the Christian faith. In, in, in this whole part of the world, and uh, we'll talk about that when we get to Ephesians a little bit more. And then from there, took a boat back uh, to Caesarea and then back to Jerusalem as the end of the second missionary journey. All right? Lots of traveling. But you begin to see all of these places he went where there are churches being planted and where the gospel is being spread. Uh, now, after Pentecost, there had been a lot of Jews who had come from all over the eastern Mediterranean. To, for Pentecost. Some of those became believers. They listened to Peter's preaching, they came to believe in Jesus, and they took it back home. For instance, there were already Jews in Rome before Paul ever got there or anybody else because they'd gone back from Pentecost, the second chapter of Acts. But still, the planting of churches, the appointing of elders, the teaching and encouraging of these people in the faith, Paul was responsible for planting the Christian faith throughout all of Asia Minor and into Europe. And then later on would be responsible, as we say, the tradition has him going as far as Spain or even Great Britain. Then, the third missionary journey. How long did that second one take? Um, three years. I think, I think it's three years. Actually. So 49 to 51. Yeah, well, 49 to 51. So 49, 50, 51. Three years. Michael. Tarsus to Ephesus, or modern-day Tarsus to Izmir, is 600 
600 miles. Okay, 600 miles. So, not 1,000, 600. When I said 1,000, it's not 1,000. Uh, still, still a long way. But from okay. That part, that yeah, part. okay, from this part. Because Turkey does come over here. Right. Uh, so, from, uh, you know, so, so from here, Tarsus, to, well, um, Izmir would be Smyrna. Um, Smyrna is the ancient city, the modern city is Izmir. So, 600 and some miles there. Okay? Marvin. Was the first journey that uh, a couple times the Spirit said, don't go for the Asia? Well, actually, what happened on the second journey is Paul, his intention was to go north and to visit some other areas. And the Spirit kept saying, no, that's not where I want you to go. And he, you get the impression that Paul was like, he'd go this way and then, you know, he'd get directed and he'd sort of, and then they, the, he'd get pushed, get, he kept getting pushed back. And he ended up in Troas, instead of being able to go up here like to Byzantium or Constantinople. And he um, then saw the vision of going across. If he had ended up up there, then who knows whether he would have made it across to Philippi and Thessalonica and Berea and Corinth and all those other places. But part of what you hear is, this is, we call this Asia Minor, or it was called Asia Minor. This was the Roman province of Asia, and it ran up into uh, Bithynia up here. And so Paul was trying to get further north into the province of Asia and kept getting pushed kind of west. And then he ended up from Troas going across into Europe. So, all right. So then Paul's third journey. Uh, he starts out once again in Antioch. That became his home base. Um, Antioch was, the, was a major city. In fact, Antioch was one of the four major cities of the Christian world originally. There were four patriarchies later on. Those were Alexandria, Jerusalem, Antioch and Rome. Okay. Um, Antioch was the third most important city in the Roman Empire after uh, Rome and Alexandria. So it was very significant and the site of the first uh, gen predominantly Gentile church and the base of operations for Paul and Barnabas after that. So that's where he kept coming back to. It was a ways away from, you know, his, his home was here, but Antioch was his adopted home. And then he, he made several trips down to Jerusalem as well from there. So his third missionary journey, again he leaves from Antioch, he goes up here, crosses over, and instead of going up this way in the northern part of Myasia, he goes down to Ephesus. He spends three years in Ephesus, having visited several places he'd been to before. By the way, on this map, you'll see these places with a cross on it. There's a box with a cross, can you see that? Pergamum, Thyatira, Smyrna, Sardis, Philadelphia, Ephesus, Laodicea. Those are the seven churches that are mentioned in the book of Revelation. Okay, the, the, they're especially considered landmark churches for the, for the faith because they were the ones that the Holy Spirit inspired John to write to um, as part of the book of Revelation. Um, the trip that the Hansons and Carolyn and I took, we visited six of those seven as part of our uh, that journey in the footsteps of Paul and John or whatever it was called. I, I think Paul. But, um, Ephesus, Paul spent three years there teaching. Ephesus was where Timothy ended up being pastor. Ephesus was where John the Apostle lived for the later part of his life. It's likely, we believe, tradition has, and we, I think it's true, that Mary, the mother of Jesus, lived there with you know, John. Um, and it's just an unbelievable place to visit. If you haven't been to Ephesus, the, the most significant archaeological ruins in the world today are considered Ephesus, and they're finding new stuff all the time. So it's quite exciting. From Ephesus, Paul crossed over again into Macedonia and then back down to Corinth, back up again. He's visiting a lot of the places he'd been to before. And then from Philippi, he sort of reversed and came back over to uh, Troas, comes back down around this way and has a bunch of different visits, ends up coming back. And we're told that he actually was in a big hurry um, in, the, in the return voyage because he wanted to get back to Jerusalem before the Passover. This is in the book of Acts. All of these are recorded in the book of Acts. Paul refers to various parts of this in his letters, but the primary history, the historical record, is the book of Acts. He, he's trying to get back for, uh, to Jerusalem for Passover. When he does get back to Jerusalem, he is uh, recognized by Jews. They're called Asian Jews. When they say Asia in the Bible, they don't mean over here, Asia, like we do. This is Asia. So it meant Jews from this part of, of Asia Minor and Asia. Asia was the provincial name that the Romans gave it. The whole of this area was the large areas called Asia Minor. It's like saying, I'm from Tennessee, but it's part of the South, which is part of the United States. 
Okay. Um, that's why you have different words sometimes, Asia versus Asia Minor versus, you know, um, various other categories. So Paul is set upon by Jews who are beating him because, and they make the accusation falsely that he had brought a Gentile into the um, interior areas of the temple, which he had not done. But all they could say later was, well, we saw him in town in Jerusalem with a Gentile, and so we thought he brought him in. But there's no record of that. The Roman guards in the Antonia Fortress hear this kerfuffle that's going on. They come out because the Antonia Fortress opens out right onto the outer courts of the temple in Jerusalem, or did. They come out, they grab Paul, they take him in, they're getting ready to beat him. And he says, well, do you usually beat a Roman citizen without a trial? And they kind of freak, and so the centurion is feeling like he's not got to protect this guy. Paul goes out to, uh, they bring him out to be heard. The, the Roman centurion won a great trial to be heard in front of the Sanhedrin. And Paul, being the witty guy that he is, he says, the reason I'm in, on trial here today is because I believe in the resurrection, and I've been preaching that. Well, the Pharisees believed in the resurrection. They were part of the Sanhedrin. The Sadducees didn't. And so when he said, I'm here today, I've been arrested, I'm in trouble because I believe in the resurrection and preach it, the Pharisees go, yeah, you the man, we like you. <laughs> And the Sadducees go, no, no. And so they start fighting each other. And Paul, I'm sure, is just standing there kind of grinning. So the Romans take him back out because they think there's going to be another riot. When they take him back out, and he's in the Antonia Fortress, just right next to the temple courtyards, um, Paul's nephew shows up and says he has heard that there is a plot to assassinate Paul and that there is a group of men, of zealots, who have said they are neither going to eat nor drink until they kill Paul. Well, Paul tells his nephew, go tell the centurion guard that they tell him that. And because he's a Roman citizen and the centurion who's in charge is already scared, he's going to be in trouble because he, you know, how he's been treating this guy when he found out he was a citizen. But they take him under cover at night with a huge body. I mean, they've got foot soldiers and cavalry, everything but artillery, to get Paul to Caesarea in the north along the coast, which is where the center for the Roman control of Palestine was. They take him to Caesarea. He ends up spending two years in Caesarea because they had a governor at that time who was not a very good guy. In fact, he ended up being called to Rome because of accusations of impropriety <coughs> and dishonesty and all kinds of stuff. And the guy refused to either try Paul or let him go because he kept hoping somebody would offer him a bribe. Either Paul would give him a bribe to let him go, or the Jews would give him a bribe to, you know, to uh, kill him or do something else to him. And finally, a new governor comes in who apparently is a really good guy. This is Felix and Festus, or these the governors, you read those names in Acts. And he shows up, he gets to Caesarea, he's there like a day, he goes to Jerusalem and spends a few, a little time there in order to get to know the Jewish leaders, the people he's supposed to be in charge of. He comes back to Caesarea and immediately calls Paul in to find out what's going on and why has this guy been in jail here for two years. And he's really trying to do the right thing. Uh, Herod Agrippa II comes in with his sister Bernice. They're invited to talk to Paul as well because they've heard about him. So you've got the Roman governor and the, the Herod Agrippa II interviewing Paul. They're ready to let him go. They agree later, well, you know, there's nothing wrong. This guy hasn't done anything wrong. The Jews have got some problem here, but we don't know what it is. And he doesn't seem like a bad guy to us. But before they can declare that officially, Paul appeals to Rome. And the governor says, to Rome you have appealed, to Rome you will go. And so he sends him to Rome. And so the next journey that Paul has is his trip to Rome, which is quite eventful. They leave out from uh, Caesarea. What's that? Uh, they go up to, and then take a boat. Now, the problem is the Mediterranean Sea is like an ocean in terms of scale, and they have huge storms. There are certain seasons of the year that you particularly in those days, you didn't want to travel. Well, it got later and later and later, and they, they, they're landed here in Lycia, and they decide that the captain of the guard, who's in control, and the pilot of the ship decide, I think we can make it. We're going to take off. So they leave. They get storms. They land at Fair Havens on Crete. They take off, and in here, a lot of maps, they have, you know, the, the thing does hit this here, because they have this huge storm. Paul prophesied that their... Um, they all need to stay on board. The sailors try to jump ship because they think they can get away and leave these guys to die. The centurions make sure they stay on board. 
They all go through this terrible shipwreck. They're shipwrecked on Malta. The ship is destroyed, but Paul had prophesied they would all survive. They all survive. They land there. And, again, it's a sign of what Paul was like that in those days, a Roman guard who let a prisoner escape was executed in place of the prisoner. So the last thing you should do is, if you're a Roman is let a prisoner escape. When they're getting ready to be shipwrecked on Malta, some of the other soldiers ask the centurion, should we kill the prisoners so they don't escape if we're going to be shipwrecked? And the centurion says, no, release them. So they unchain them and let them get to shore. And they're all there. They don't run away. Paul doesn't run away. They're all together, so everything works out fine. But the fact that the centurion would have done that for Paul means that he had developed affection for him. You know, he liked him. Uh, Paul was a good guy. He certainly could be bold. But he was apparently likable because he, we have several instances where he relates well to people that are supposed to be his captors. He then is taken up um, between Sicily, they get by sea, the, he ends up in Rome. In Rome, he is kept as a, under house arrest for two years. The interesting thing is that while he is in jail in Rome and ministering to the, to the church that's there, the book of Acts, Luke's account, ends. And that's the last official account we have, historical account, of what happened to Paul. A lot of people believe, as we talked about last week, I think, that Luke intended to write either more or write another book, you know, to pick up where that left off. But that leaves us without a, an absolutely clear sense of what happened to Paul. But the very strong tradition is that after Paul was arrested, he spent two years in house arrest, in a house that he rented in Rome, that he then ended up being released and he went on another journey. And at the end of that journey, you know, this is in uh, AD 62, after two years in AD 64, he was released, took another journey, and this is the best, the best idea, we don't know this for a fact, and was later arrested again for, viol for not worshiping the emperor and advocating and belief in Jesus, and was in, uh, finally martyred in Rome about AD 67. This is the best idea that people have, and you'll see di different versions of this, of what might have been, according to, tra to tradition, not to scripture, but to tradition, what might have been Paul's fourth mission, or fifth, depending on if you call the visit to Rome the fourth. You know, this is either the fourth missionary journey or the fifth, depending on what, what you call his trip to Rome, a, a prison ship trip, or whether it was a missionary trip. Uh, he left from Rome, he came down, and again, this is... There are references in Timothy and other places that he went to Crete and then back up to Nicopolis, which is in uh, Greece. It's on the western coast of what we know as Greece. Achaia was the, the area there. And then that he went back down, and from here, it picks up that, to Spain. That's what that says. That he went to Spain. Some said he made a loop in Spain and back. Some say he went to Spain. Then around Spain up to Britannia, Great Britain. That was a Roman province. And so it's not unreasonable that Paul would have gone there. It was part of the civilized world. It's not like he went to the New Hebrides or something. Uh, but whether he went just to Spain, whether he went there, the tradition is that he went to the West. As I said, in Romans, there is a reference to the fact that he said, when I'm on my way to Spain, I will try to stop by and see you. So that was his intention. If he was released, it's not unreasonable to think that he might have done this. He then, from there came back to Rome where he was arrested again, imprisoned, and eventually beheaded. Now, that la this last part is according to tradition. Clement the first, or I'm sorry, Clement of Rome and others declare for certain that when he left, um, he was released from prison, and when he left prison, he did travel again as far as Spain. Uh, Clement said actually to, to the westernmost regions of the empire. Did you have questions about any of that? Becky. Are there any other um, accounts of that Paul did go to Britain? Uh, are there any other people that wrote? Well, again, tradition from later. You know, Clement is from the second century, so we're we're looking at sixty or seventy years later. Um, Irenaeus of Lyon also declared in the second century that um, that Paul had traveled to the west. Um, the, let's see, I've got some other names here. Uh, it, when we get further down, uh, Augustine, in his writings, this is in the 5th century, he affirmed that that was true as well. So, it's just tradition. It is not written like the book of Acts. We've got very clear indication of what the missionary journeys were and all of that. And that stops before this. But we believe that tradition holds that it's accurate. And I think that tradition has some credence. Uh, 
it's not like our faith stands or falls on whether or not Paul had the last missionary journey, but um, we believe it's likely because he expressed his intention to, and we don't believe he was um, killed during his first arrest in Rome, uh, AD 60, 62 to 64. Okay. Any questions about any of that? Yes, Susan. Just the date for his first missionary journey. Yeah, um, I'll just go back so you can get these. Yeah. The first journey around uh, AD 47 to 49, most of these were two to three years. So that was the first journey where he visited the, the western part. And, and let me talk about this. I'll, I'll go to this slide and do this. Uh, the second journey, 49 to 51, two to three years in there. Third, gener uh, third journey, 52 to 57. This one was longer because he spent three years just in Ephesus. Well, two and a half years. One of the things in Scripture that makes it a little hard to track is when, whenever you get to a portion of a year, they just make it the next year. You know, if he was there for two years and four months, they would have said three years. They just generally, that's how they rounded in those days. Uh, and then the journey to Rome, 62, we believe that this journey probably was somewhere around 64 to 67. Okay, yes? Is there a date for when Saul was witnessing the, the stoning of Stephen? Um, yes, we believe, in fact, let me make sure I get this right. Um, Actually, I bet it's. I have a whole timeline here somewhere. I'm going to do it. I've got a date in my head, but I want to make sure I don't give you the wrong one. When I lean over like this, the camera thinks that the water cooler is talking. <laughs> um, okay, here we go. <coughs> Uh, we believe that the persecution um, was in like AD 30 to 33, and then 33 to 36 was when Paul was uh, completing his persecution, and then that leads up to traveling to Damascus and then three years in Arabia. So we believe that was around the year 33. Yes. He was ministering, right? Trying to start churches and, and encouraging believers and all of that. How, um, what languages are involved in all these different places? Right. Um, it, part of your question is what languages did Paul speak? <laughs> yeah. We have evidence that he would, would have been able to speak Greek, and that was the, the standard language throughout the empire following Alexander the Great. So Greek, he would have spoken Hebrew, as a, as a Pharisee and a student of Gamaliel, um, he would have spoken Aramaic, which was the day-to-day -day language of the, of the streets you know, in, in uh, Palestine at that time, because Aramaic was the same as Chaldean, which was the language of the Babylonians. The Babylonian captivity meant that there were at least three generations of Jews that grew up in Babylon <laughs> learning Aramaic, and it was still the, uh, the general language of the people um, during the time of Jesus. And so Paul would have spoken at least Greek, Hebrew and Aramaic. There's some indication that he also would have spoken uh, Latin. We don't know that for a fact, but there's a suggestion based upon some of his use of words. He, there are places, one of the reasons we're, we know he spoke Hebrew and, and Greek is he quotes the Old Testament a lot. Most of the time when he quotes the Old Testament, he quotes the Hebrew version of the Old Testament, which is slightly different than the Septuagint, which had been around for 300, 200, almost 300 years by then. Septuagint was the Greek version of the Old Testament. Some writers, that, that New Testament writers, that quote the Old Testament very clearly are quoting from the Septuagint, which meant Greek would have been, they were more in toward Greek. Paul used more Hebrew, but there's a couple places where he used Greek. The fact that he was trained in Tarsus, which was a very Hellenized kind of, you know, I told you that, that they taught philosophy, the Stoic philosophy was centered there, they taught philosophy, they taught literature and rhetoric very Greek style education. So we're absolutely sure that Paul would have spoken at least those three languages, Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic, and very likely a fourth Latin. So, yes, Mary. Would he have lived long enough to know about the destruction of Jerusalem? No. The destruction of Jerusalem was in AD 70. Um, there's virtually nobody who believes he lived that long. Generally, they, they believe he either was killed 63 or 64, in other words, that he didn't have that last missionary journey, or that he had that last journey and he would have been killed in 67. So he would probably have been aware of threats to Israel, I mean, threats to Palestine from the Romans, because 
they built up to that. It wasn't all at once. 70, 80, 70 was when they just finally said that's enough and they destroyed the city. But no, he would not have been alive during the destruction of Jerusalem. Other questions? Yes, Michael. The Spaniards are pretty big on chronicling their history. Is there any evidence that? There are traditions in Spain that Paul visited as well. Yeah. Um, I can't quote them to you, but I, I know that there are references to the fact that Paul visited there. I mean, I also believe that, you know, the, the, some of the other apostles visited there. Well, the second largest uh, site for pilgrimages is in uh, Spain. Exactly. Um, and so, based upon the fact that, uh, who was it again? Which apostle was it? Well, they said... St. James. James, yeah. Went to Santiago de Yeah, Santiago is St. James. So Santiago de Compostela, which uh, is on the, west. on the west side, which, it, you know, it's, oh, wait there. It is over here. Okay. But, but the timing was so strange. We were just there in the fall. And the timing, when he was supposed to have been coming and when they found the double. Right. Yeah. And Saint Ignatius, and um, yeah, that's a um, it, the timing. Our Spanish friends were telling us this real seriously, and I said, "But that doesn't seem right. Like there were crusades and yep. stuff." Right? Well, the the Spanish believe that Saint James promised he would return whenever Spain needed him, and they believe that it was a return of Saint, a miraculous return of Saint James that led them to drive the Moors out. <laughs> okay. Um, so, um, so it wasn't that he was still there alive; it's that he came back miraculously. In fact, if, if you guys, um, you guys know about the Richard Sharp series, it's by Bernard Cornwell. It's about the the um, the, pen, the Peninsular Campaign of the British against Napoleon. And a lot of it takes place in Spain and in Portugal. Well, one of the one of the episodes that they have it was a, it's a series of books, which are really good because I like this historical fiction kind of stuff, and they're very accurate historically. But one of the books, and then one of the movies that they made out of it, um, is in Santiago de Compostela, Compostela, and the idea is that there's a banner, a flag, that was from St. James, and that in times of great need, if they fly that flag, that St. James will return and, and save them. Well, in this case, they wanted him to save, wanted St. James to come back and save them from Napoleon. You know, so down through Spanish history, there's been that expectation that some of the apostles came there. Either, you know, St. James, what's that? What was that? Oh, that's uh, Bernard Cornwell, if you like historical fiction. Bernard Cornwell, and it's the Richard Sharp series. He's a rifleman for the British military. Yes. Uh, who spoke Latin in that part of the world, and why did the Romans that conquered the Greeks speak the Greek language? Well, the Romans tended to speak uh, Latin, but Latin is a very is a very um, trim language. You know, it's a very focused, a very succinct language. The Greeks, who invented philosophy, they needed you know their language tended to be able to expand, be more expansive and more subtle and more. You know, get into more uh, conceptual kinds of stuff. The Latin language tended to be very matter of fact. I mean, they were the road builders, and they they didn't have time to waste. They, in fact, when it came to having gods, they just adopted the Greek gods instead of coming up with their own. You know, very efficient. <laughs> so the Latins, the Latin uh, would have been spoken in any center where where the Romans really were in control. But they also would have spoken Greek. Okay, that that would have also been the case if if it were. You know, something having to do just with the Roman world, it would have been Latin, but anything having to do with the arts or with um, philosophy or anything of that sort, Greek would have been the common language, thanks to Alexander, to, you know, 350 years before that. Okay? Let's take a break. I've got like three minutes after two. Uh, let's take a break until about ten after. Some, some uh, specifics that we don't have absolute certainty about, like what happened after his first arrest in Rome, the last missionary trip, you know, the nature of his, the nature and exact timing of his death, but we've got a pretty complete idea. We have, in addition to the 13 books which uh, traditionally are attributed to Paul in the New Testament, from Romans to Philemon in terms of the, the, the list in the New Testament, we also have more than half of the book of Acts is focused on the life of Paul and his missionary work versus conversion. So the book of Acts, as we discussed last week, is the first part of it, the first section of it, is based upon Peter, a few other people, like Philip is a minor character, but mostly Peter, and then Paul. Now, 
With regard to uh, the 13 books, I mentioned that there is some, some liberal scholarship uh, questions some of the books as to whether or not they were really written by Paul. Um, of the 13 books, the seven that are pretty much universally accepted as being Pauline are Romans, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Philippians, 1 Thessalonians, and Philemon. Those are pretty much universally accepted as being by Paul. Liberal scholars have questioned whether or not Ephesians, Colossians, 2 Thessalonians, 1 and 2 Timothy, and Titus might, be, might have been written by someone else. The reasons that they give for that, which are the reasons that are usually given by liberal scholars for not accepting um, the traditional view, is they feel that there are differences in some of the vocabulary, of the style. Um, some would say there are differences in theology, but most, most evangelical scholars will say that the ones they have trouble with were written to specific circumstances. Most of Paul's letters were written to certain churches, specific churches, that were having specific issues. And so the theology may not resonate as being exactly parallel to a different letter because Paul may have been dealing with a different problem in those other places. Um, they also say that they have some difficulty fitting these things into Paul's biography in terms of where do they fit. Um, and, but then we don't know all the details of Paul's biography. That's one of the problems with that. The biggest thing is they think it's stylistic, that some of these letters uh, don't seem to be Pauline. Uh, the, I think the standard response to that is that it's very possible and acceptable. We know that Paul and Peter and others would have secretaries that would take dictation, or sometimes that they would outline things that would be, would be filled out by the, it's called an amanuensis. That was the Greek word for a secretary in those days. And uh, for instance, John the Apostle had an amanuensis on the island of Patmos when he did the Revelation. In fact, if you go there, there are these mosaics of John dictating while a younger man is writing it down. It's believed that in some of these cases, Paul may have been, may have given the outline of points and sort of dictated it, and then the amanuensis would have written it all up, which means they would have incorporated perhaps some of their style and a little of their vocabulary, but then Paul would have approved them. Um, we don't, as evangelicals, we don't really have trouble with that. I believe that the content of all 13 of these books, we believe, what is Paul? Either he directly wrote them, he dictated them, or he gave the outlines and points to someone else who wrote it, and then he approved it as being what he intended. So, again, our evangelical belief is that all 13, not just seven, but all 13 really are written by Paul. Some of the basic messages in Paul's theology to be aware of is... The, obviously, the strong emphasis Paul has on the death, resurrection, and the lordship of Christ. Paul, being the missionary to the Gentiles, or the evangelist to the Gentiles, he also evangelized um, Jews a lot. He always spoke in the synagogues. And interestingly enough, Peter, who's called the evangelist to the, to the Jews, Peter was the one responsible for the first Gentile conversions. Cornelius the centurion and others. And it was Peter who was given the vision of the all animals now being clean. So there's not a hard line between Peter as the evangelist to the Jews and Paul to the Gentiles. But um, one of the things that we can see is because Paul was especially concerned about ministry to the Gentiles, the, the term Messiah, Mashiach in Hebrew, or even the concept of Messiah, that the fulfillment of God's Old Testament promise would not have meant anything to Gentiles. You, uh, to the Jews, that was everything because it connected them with all of their history of beliefs of the Jewish people. So Paul, because he was concerned about communicating to Gentiles, he focuses more on the term Lord, or Kyrios, than he does on Messiah, or Christ. Now he does use Christ, he talks about Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus, or, you know, he uses those terms. But the most common way he refers to Jesus is as Lord, and you need to understand that in the pagan world, Lord was the standard dress for any, any deity, any god. They would talk about the Lord Serapis, who was, a, who was a Roman god. And so that was very common in those days and indicated Paul's commitment to first evangelize the Gentiles in a way they can understand, and secondly, to acknowledge the divinity of Jesus, again, in the way that a Gentile would have understood. So this idea of the death, resurrection, and lordship of Jesus Christ uh, he also focused on the atonement of Jesus, that Jesus, by his death for us, fulfilled the requirements of the law, that he redeemed us, literally, to pay, to get us out of bondage, that the atonement of Christ's blood made peace between God and us. He atoned for our sins, and in that way, gives us 
the promise and the availability of salvation. So the promise of salvation is another major theme because of the atonement of Jesus. And if you wanted to give like the five-point essence of the Christian message according to Paul, it would be this. One, God sent his own son. Two, the son was crucified on, for the benefit of humanity. Three, the son would soon return because he was resurrected and he would return. Four, those who belong to the Son would live with him forever, eternal salvation. And five, followers therefore are supposed to live by the highest moral standard. We have an obligation to live righteous lives because of that. So, one, God sent his Son. Two, the Son was crucified for the benefit of humanity. Three, the Son would return soon because he's still alive. Four, those who belong to the Son will live for him, with him forever. And five, because of all of that, followers of Jesus should live by the highest moral standard. That's kind of the outline of everything Paul is doing in all of his work. Um, but again, we recognize that Paul was writing to specific circumstances for specific churches uh, that he had planted in other areas. And uh, so there's a particular focus in different books. This is a list of the books, the 13 books, in the order in which they were written, we believe. Um, Galatians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, we're going to talk about those briefly today. Then Romans, Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon, Philippians, 1st Timothy, Titus, and 2nd Timothy. This chart is available to you online. It's got the basic theme from each of them, where we believe they were written from, when they were written, and who they were written to. So if you'd like to pull that chart up. Um, Let's talk a little bit now about the first of those books, which is the book of Galatians. Um, where? There we go. I know I skipped something. Um, the book of Galatians, the first of Paul's letters, we believe, um, and some people don't believe that. <laughs> some people believe it's the third of his letters. Um, Paul wrote it to the churches of Galatia, which means the churches of Asia Minor, that he had planted in his first missionary journey. Now, there's two theories about this. When I said earlier that uh, some people believe that this book was written in AD 49, some believe it was written more like AD 52, which means it would have been likely after 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, the difference is based upon where Galatia is thought to have been. The Galatians um, were a group of people, they were Celtic people, they were the Gauls. Remember, where, do you know where Gaul was? Anybody? Where's, what, what do you, we know Gaul as today? France. France. Um, they do Wisconsin too often. Um, Celtic people had settled in Gaul in Western Europe, and some of those people had migrated across Europe into Asia Minor and had settled in the north central part of what we know of as Turkey. It became known as Galatia because the people of the Gauls had settled there. Well, that and that's the northern central part of Turkey. The Romans, however, come along and they sort of restructure everything and they set it up according to govern to Roman governors and provinces so that they can govern them more clearly. Their Galatia, what they call Galatia, comes down much further south, almost all the way to the Mediterranean. So the question is, when Paul writes to the Galatians, does he mean the sort of pre-Roman historic Galatia in the north central? Or does he mean the Roman province of Galatia, which would have come further south? The difference is, the Roman province of Galatia included the, the uh, churches that he planted in his first missionary journey. Lystra and Derby and some of those others that you saw. The question is, is Paul writing the letter of Galatians to the churches he planted in the Roman province of Galatia? Or did he later on, as part of his second missionary journey, journey swing further north and have churches that are part of the historic Galatian area, named after the Gauls who moved there? The difference is, did he write the book of Galatians after the first missionary journey, around the time of the Jerusalem Council, or did he write it after the second missionary journey, and he's talking about a different location? I believe, I'm a southern Galatian guy, I believe that he wrote it after the first missionary journey, but, and about the time, immediately prior to probably the Council of Jerusalem. The reason being, the theme of Galatians 
is that these churches, there were Jewish Christians who were coming there telling them, you have to be, uh, become Jewish. They're called the Judaizers. They were saying that to be saved in Jesus Christ, you have to be circumcised, you have to obey the law of Moses, etc., etc. The reason why I believe that this was uh, written after the first missionary journey and just prior to the, to the Council of Jerusalem is that's the issue that the Council of Jerusalem talked about and settled. How do we deal with Gentile believers? In the book to the Galatians, this is what Paul is talking about. This is the whole focus of the letter, and nowhere in this letter does he say, and by the way, the council in Jerusalem already decided this, and this is what James says. Paul doesn't say that. And why in the world would he not have said that if this came after that time? Okay? Does that make sense? Yes. He would have said, James, the head of the Jerusalem council, the apostles who were still alive, everybody has agreed that you don't have to be circumcised. Paul doesn't say that. Which, to me, pretty clearly indicates that this happened, he wrote this before that council, which means it was after his first missionary journey, before the second one, and so he's talking about the southern churches, which is why I picked the AD 49 date and not 52 or so. Is that clear? You understand yes. what that discussion is? Yes. Uh, and, in fact, just so you get some idea of what we're talking about here, let me go back to, okay. Um, you'll see, this is Galatia. And Galatia goes up into here. The churches that he planted were Iconium, Lystra, Derby, down here. But the Roman province of Galatia was sort of football shaped and went like that. And the historic Galatia was further north, but the Roman province of Galatia included those churches. And that's what the question was. Which Galatia is he using in terms of the reference? Uh, I believe it was the Roman province and included those churches from the first missionary journey. Okay? So, what's happening apparently is that these Judaizers have gone back to those churches in Galatia, and they have told them that Paul is wrong, that you have to be circumcised, you have to follow the law. Um, Paul, in writing to the Galatians, he presents the doctrine of justification by grace through faith. The book of Galatians has been called the Magna Carta of the Christian faith because it is about freedom in Christ, that we do not have to have the bondage of the law. We don't have to obey the law. It is simply our faith in Christ and the grace he provides. The book of Galatians, as well as Ephesians, but Galatians especially, was very important to Martin Luther as he articulated the sort of uh, Reformation doctrines of sola fide, faith alone, sola gratia, grace alone, sola scriptura, scripture alone. But it was important to Luther. John Wesley relied heavy, heavily on the book of Galatians in developing the, the Reformation that was the, the Methodist movement um, in England. So in Galatians, Paul is addressing what's really an oppressive theology that the Jewish uh, legalizers, or the legalistic uh, Jewish uh, Christians, were trying to impress on people, the bondage, as Paul called it, that he was trying to place on them. And Paul's intention is to make sure that the Galatians understand that that's a false theology. That, and in the process, Paul presents sort of a dynamic faith union with Christ that is represented and visibly manifested in baptism. Uh, and he relates all brothers and sisters, uh, or all Christian believers as being brothers and sisters, bound together through their baptism in faith in Jesus Christ, and not because of the law or obedience to the Jewish law. Okay? Um, Paul says that, he starts out the book of Galatians saying, Are you so quick to fall away from the faith that you were taught and believe these people? What's wrong with you? you know? he, uh, so the gospel of grace defended is the first section, the first two chapters. Then he goes into more explanation of how that works in chapters 3 and 4. And then he talks about how we apply it to our lives uh, at the end of the book in chapters 5 and 6. Um, any questions about that? I don't have a lot of time to go into a lot more detail. And you all have all read this, so it's... Uh, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> uh, the end of the book of... Yeah, because it, was on a, it wasn't on your list. And you're certainly not going to read a book of the Bible before I tell you you have to. I know. So. <laughs> uh, one of the things that's interesting about this is Galatians is the book that at the very end of it, Paul says... And see here at the end of this letter how I write this with my own hands. because You can tell because of the very large letters that I write. Well, some scholars have said that simply means Paul is so enthusiastic. He's just really making this you know, emphatic. Some others, which is the way I tend to go, is uh, that 
this may be one of the indications that Paul had a recurring difficulty with his eyesight. And that he had a secretary and he would dictate his letters or outline his letters for them to write and he would prove them. But that in certain cases, just to show this really is me, he would actually put sort of the postscript on them. But his eyesight was so bad he had to write very large. Um, and we believe that's probably the thing he refers to when he talks about having a thorn in my flesh. Three times I asked the Lord to, to uh, take it away, and all three times God said to me, no, my, my, uh, my grace is made perfect in your weakness. Um, and so that's, we believe that's what Paul was all about. A um, couple of key verses here, Galatians 2, 20 and 21, Paul writes, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and saved and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. The law is not what gets you saved. And then from Galatians 5.1, it is for freedom that Christ has set you free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. So this little book, the six chapters of Galatians, powerful, powerful declaration of uh, freedom and grace in Jesus Christ, as opposed to those who would say it was a salvation by works. Okay, questions about that? It's like everybody's starting to scratch your ear once. <laughs> so, okay. Mark, you just said the highest moral standard. So with the law, it's the fifth point of Paul. When the law says thou shalt not kill or steal or, or uh, def, uh, uh, defame one another, and he's saying, give to the widows, give to the poor, he kind of decrees it's the act of doing, right. as opposed to not doing. And it's not a matter that you have to do those things to be saved. We are saved, and again, that's why it's fifth. After everything else, after our salvation is found in Jesus Christ, the Son of God who sacrificed himself for us, because of that, our response to that grace should be to live a righteous life. Not so we're getting saved. You know, people always get that upside down. And he wrote that specifically to a group of people uh, who were being told by these Judaizers, yes, you have your works is what save you. If you don't do these works, if you don't get circumcised and not eat pork and blah, 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 then you can't be part of Christ. You can't be saved. Paul said, no, that's not what gets you saved. But once you are in the Lord, you have an obligation to live the most righteous life you can. And that's where James is coming in. Okay? All right, let's talk about the second and third book we believe Paul wrote. And again, <coughs> scholars who believe the Northern Galatian theory believe this was written later and probably that the Thessalonians, first and second Thessalonians were the first books. I believe the other way around. I believe Galatians was first. Um, the first and second book uh, letters to the Thessalonians are words of encouragement that the, the church in Thessalonica was being heavily persecuted. Which is not surprising because when Paul first visited Thessalonica, uh, he they had a riot. You know, they, the Jews in that town were so up in arms against against Paul and his companions that when Paul and his companions left very quickly and went to Berea, these Thessalonican Jews followed them to Berea, which is you know it's a ways away. It's not like going from you know from here to someone to like upon or someone don't need to like upon. It was a good distance. It's like from here to the other side of Guadalajara, you know, they made an effort on it, and in order to try to keep people from listening to Paul. So the, uh, there were anti-Christian elements in Thessalonica that were very aggressive and very emphatic about trying to suppress this, and the church in Thessalonica had been suffering from that. We believe that it was, was written in AD 51 or 52. The, a major emphasis, because the church was so persecuted in, uh, the, in Thessalonica, they were very concerned about how long are we going to have to take this before the Lord comes back. It was very common at this time for people to believe that Jesus was going to return like any day, that it was not going to be long. Paul even believed that it would not be long. So when he first, um, you know, during his early days of his ministry, he probably was communicating that you, you may be persecuted, but, but hold out because it won't be long before the Lord comes back. Well, the Thessalonians have communicated back to Paul and said how long now is it going to be that we're going to have to experience this? Because it's pretty horrible. And Paul is trying to encourage them. He's uh, talking to them about the second coming of Christ. He's trying to not only instruct them, but encourage and support them, particularly in light of persecution. 
Um, and the, he wrote this book, probably 51 or 52, and sent it off to them. Now, Thessalonica was a city of about 200,000 people, which was a pretty substantial city in those days. Um, and so, uh, as the church there was struggling and suffering, enduring persecution, Paul wanted to try to encourage them. And so he writes to them about the coming of Christ. The problem is that after he writes this first letter, and he commends them for their commitment, for their growth, he um, emphasizes Tim Timothy's efforts to apparently um, encourage the Thessalonians because he left Timothy behind there. And uh, Timothy later ended up in Ephesus, but he was in Thessalonica for a while. And then he gives them directions for how they can continue to grow, uh, how they could, should think about Apparently they had asked Paul about, well, what about those who are already dead in Christ? You know, what's going to happen to them if Jesus is going to come back any day now? And um, so Paul gives some instructions about all of that. Apparently, he sends this to them and then finds out almost immediately that some of them had misunderstood or misinterpreted some of the things that he wrote. So he turns around almost immediately and sends the second book of Thessalonians, which is why the, the dates are going to look like they're exactly the same, because we believe there was somewhere between six months and 18 months or probably closer to six months to 12 months in between the writing of these two letters because word came back to Paul that they had misunderstood something that he'd said in his first letter. Um, let me give you the key verses for this and then we'll go on to 2 Thessalonians. Uh, key verses for 1 Thessalonians would be 1 Thessalonians 3, 12 and 13. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else just as ours does for you. This, Paul is trying to be a pastoral voice of love and concern and encouragement here. May he strengthen your heart so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. And then from 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 to 18. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. That's a passage that I often use in memorial services because it is our, it's the declaration of our hope. This is what we look to. And no, it didn't come 2,000 years ago when, you know, when the Thessalonians thought it was going to come right then. But uh, we still hope and expect that because that is the promise to us. Then we get to 2 Thessalonians, written, as I say, a short time later, apparently because there had been a misunderstanding from the first one. Paul, the theme is the same. He's encouraging the persecuted believers. He's exhorting them to steadfastness in uh, holding up against persecution that was occurring um, and clarifying some of the points that he had made in his first letter so that they were not confused by all of that. Um, again, encouragement of persecution is, the, is a major theme. Explanation of the day of the Lord, which is the returning day of the Lord. That doesn't mean the Sabbath. The, the Christian version of the Sabbath, that means when the Lord returns, the day of the Lord. And then exhortation to them as a church. Um, the scripture verses there would be, the primary scripture verses would be 2 Thessalonians. I'm looking for my, my passages here. So I'm going to crane my neck. Okay. 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 to 3. Concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, one of the things that they've written back to Paul is somebody had apparently told the Thessalonians in between these two letters that the Lord had already come back and they missed him. <laughs> <laughs> and so Paul, part of what 2 Thessalonians was to, was to correct was the idea that no, 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 when he comes back, you'll know it. It's not going to be, it's not going to be confusing. So 2 Thessalonians 2 says, Concerning the coming of the, our, our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, report, or letter supposing, supposed to have come from us, Paul means he and the other leaders, saying that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in this way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed and the man doomed to destruction, which is the Antichrist. Then uh, from verses 13 and 14 of 2 Thessalonians 2, from the beginning, God chose you to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. He called you to this through our gospel, that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the teaching we pass on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. 
So it is a book about encouragement in the face of uh, persecution, of encouragement as you await the day of the Lord, and instruction about exactly how it's going to work between now and the time the Lord comes back, and what to expect when it actually happens. Okay? The theme of First and Second Thessalonians. And as, actually, uh, First and Second Thessalonians are, are the, other than the book of Revelation, are the most eschatological of all the New Testament books, meaning they deal more with what's going to happen at the end. Because they talk about the return of the Lord and what to expect and how that's going to work. So um, a lot of people don't think about Paul's letters being particularly about the end times. But that's exactly what 1 and 2 Thessalonians is about. As a way of encouraging the, in the midst of persecution today. Okay? Any questions about that? Comments? Marvin? Can you elaborate a little more, more on the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit? Well, um... It's an ongoing... Right. The, uh, the reason I hesitate is because how much can I say that's appropriate specifically to this part of Paul versus the larger. Um, the salvation is of Jesus Christ. Sanctification, which is the process of becoming more holy, of being strengthened in our faith, comforted in the midst of suffering, um, to be encouraged and growing more like Jesus and closer to the Lord, those are all part of the process of sanctification that comes after salvation. And so it's very appropriate that Paul is talking, is writing to the Thessalonian church because the comforter or paraclete that is the Holy Spirit is the one that can comfort them in the midst of their persecution, can teach them and educate them in preparation for the coming of the Lord. Uh, and so, so much of the function of what the Holy Spirit is supposed to be doing in sanctifying us is exactly what the, the church in Thessalonica needed. And so that's why Paul talked about sanctification. Okay. All right, let's move on to the fourth book that Paul wrote, which is 1 Corinthians. Um, 1 Corinthians, we believe, was written about 56 or 57, and you'll know we do have ranges in here because we try to be a little bit humble about it. Nobody knows exactly because it's not like we have the original book with uh, you know, the, the date stamp in front of it or whatever, you know. Somebody checked this out of the library on this date so we know how old it is. Um, but we believe that it was written probably four years or so after the uh, first and second Thessalonians. Paul here is writing to the Corinthian church involving um, immaturity that has existed. He's gotten a report of divisions within the church that different people are claiming that they follow Paul or they follow Apollo or they follow different people. It's created divisions. He's also gotten reports that there is immorality, even incest, that he addresses in 1 Corinthians, that's occurring. Um, and so he's addressing those issues and telling them, you know, in no uncertain terms how to deal with that and what they have to do about it, and that they're, they're called to um, holy and righteous living. Uh, the 1 Corinthians, Paul counters the sort of immorality and the lust by giving a very clear theology and doctrine of love. 1 Corinthians, of course, is where we have 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, where Paul goes into great length describing what true love, in a Christian sense, is supposed to look like, as opposed to what they thought. It's important to note that uh, Corinth was a city that was renowned for uh, being a, uh, a sin center. It, it, it was the Las Vegas of its day. I mean, what... What happens in Corinth stays in Corinth. <laughs> um, it, it was a famous city because the city of Corinth was right on a very thin isthmus in between the main body of what we knew of as Greece, Achaia in those days, and the Peloponnese, which was a big peninsula. The distance, um, and it really was on this isthmus that connected two seas. The city became quite wealthy and quite famous. I mean, it was a sailor town. It's what it was, because all of these ships from both directions, for a long time they would dock there, and it was cheaper to unload their cargo and have it ported across this narrow isthmus to the other sea, and literally pick the boats up and put them on, on log rollers and roll them to the other sea, and then put it back in the water and reload it. That was cheaper and faster than having to sail all the way, all the way around the Peloponnese. Let me go back to a map and see if I can point that out to you, so you see what I mean. Um, Okay, you see this. This area here is the Pel Peloponnese, and this is Ikea. This is a little misleading. It really wasn't that wide there. And so ships coming from up here in the Adriatic or even further over in, in the Mediterranean, instead of sailing all the way around here 
it was much faster to come here and just cut across and then there's Athens or there's you know the Aegean Sea or any, anything coming from anywhere here in the Aegean from Asia Minor even from down here uh, they they would sail here cut across and so Corinth was very wealthy because they charged for all of the services and they charged taxes and whatnot um, and it was a bawdy town it was like any place where a bunch of sailors were going to hang out you know and there were brothels and there were <laughs> pagan temples that had temple prostitutes and there was all kinds of wildness well part of what Paul is talking about when he's talking to the Corinthians is that kind of attitude that immorality that inclination toward the sins of the flesh had begun to infect the church because after all a lot of the people who became Christians who came to the church came out of that world in fact this is one of the places where um, women had been priestesses and temple prostitutes and a temple prostitute in those days were they were in charge I mean they they weren't just somebody a woman who got abused for this religion they tended to be the ones that were running things the belief is that some of these women who had been leaders and uh, priestesses and whatnot in the temple cults had converted to Christianity and they ended up trying to run the churches and they were causing problems so some of Paul's admonitions to women to calm down right, the thing that's trying the, the verse in Timothy that uh, says I want women to be silent it's a bad translation it's I want women to be calm the indication was that women were being really loud and rowdy, and it's particularly because of the culture that they had come out of. And the whole church was being infected with this kind of immorality. And so Paul is writing to uh, address issues of factions. Apparently there were lawsuits between members of the church. There was immorality, uh, various kinds of questionable practices. They were abusing the Lord's Supper. They were people that were wealthy or, or were prestigious, were being allowed to come and eat first, and then poor people were sort of being shuffled off and Paul says for instance you know you don't take the Lord's Supper in order to satisfy you know your hunger this is not gluttony eat at home so you're not hungry and then come and have the Lord's Supper that's not what this is for because they were getting it all wrong and so there were a number of other issues they were there were abuses of claims that people had about the spiritual gifts all of these were the kinds of issues that Paul is trying to address in 1st Corinthians um, and they they were messed up <laughs> um, and so Corinthians begins to address that through, again, the divisions, the, the, the fornication, and other questions have been raised. Questions about that? Let's see a hand. Okay. Um, I have a, just a mic. Yes. We were there many, many years ago. Um, it seems to me that there was, you know, in that isthmus we talked about? There's now a canal. A canal, okay, yeah. All right. Initially, in Paul's day, there was just an overland isthmus that they would, they would cart, that was cartage, they would carry the stuff over. Later on, they dug a canal, and now, when you're driving to Corinth, you cross bridges over that canal, and it drops down like, I don't know, 200 feet yeah. to the water, and it's these sheer walls yeah. that they, and it was quite an engineering marvel when they did it. I don't remember when did they do it. A long time ago. I mean, he's been there for a long time, but since Paul. Um, and, and so they, <laughs> they put it in after Paul. You know, they did some amazing. They did some amazing architectural stuff, even by Paul's time. You know, things like the Temple of Artemis and things like that, the Colossus of Rhodes. Yes. But this, they dug out this this canal, and now and the walls are very steep. The first time we we were on a, a trip that it was a, a small ship and visiting. Um, various parts of the Aegean, you know, we went to um, Montenegro and to um, Dubrovnik and various other places, and when we came to Athens, we went through that canal, you know, so you, you it's usable, it, it's used all the time. You sail through it, and these, these rock walls go straight up, like I say, it's, I, if I recall correctly, it's like 200 feet, it's huge. I certainly wouldn't want to fall off those bridges, uh, so. Okay, so uh, that's who Paul is writing to here. And he also was oh, addressing. I found out it was construction began in 1881. Oh, so and date of first use was 1893. Okay, so it's 130, 120 years ago. Yes, the marvels of technology. You do realize how scary it is for a teacher when you've got people out here. Who go, <laughs> so don't do that unless I ask. Every once in a while, I see somebody with a computer smirking, and I think. Oh, um, 
also specifically addresses some questions like the way that the church is to operate and, and resurrection. There had been reports from the Corinthians that the uh, resurrected Christ had been spotted somewhere. And so Paul addresses the issue of the resurrection. There probably was concern or confusion amongst the Corinthians about the resurrection because resurrection was not something that was part of Greek thought. And Corinth was a very Greek city. I mean, it was in uh, Greece. <laughs> and it was, a, a, so many of the Greek temples were there, so much of what they were about was Greek thought, and that was part of what got them into trouble. And part of their confusion of the resurrection was resurrection was not something that Greek philosophy uh, understood or thought about or had said anything about. And so Paul had to, had to do more to clarify that with them. Some of the key verses that you have, 1 Corinthians 6, 19-20, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. This for the immorality that they were, they were practicing. And 1 Corinthians 10, 13, No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. You see, I mean, you've probably heard these verses before, but when you understand the context that the Corinthians were falling into immorality, because that's the nature of the, of the city and of the place where they lived, these verses were very specific to those kind of needs, or those kind of problems. And then, of course, 1 Corinthians 13, which I will not quote the whole thing, you probably know it. It's the love chapter, and the 13th verse says, And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. And Paul is giving a picture, a very vivid image of what true love, godly love, looks like as opposed to the false love of lust that the people were giving into and making a mistake about how they treated each other. Okay. Yes? Uh, when he says, surrender my body to the flames, is he talking about a sacrifice or a wood? Well, uh, it's very possible that he's talking about sacrifice because the... A lot of the pagan religions uh, would have human sacrifice. That was less a part of the Greek religions than it was some of the Canaanite religions. But I think what he's suggesting there is, even if I make the ultimate sacrifice of religious faith, you know, I, I allow myself to be immolated yes. for my faith, that's not going to do me any good unless I have love. So um, that's what he's referring to. Most of the of the sacrifice, human sacrifice, that existed again more in the Canaanite religions than in the Greek religions. But um, it usually was of children, or it was of slaves. It was of people who weren't choosing to do this of their own will. So he's giving kind of an analogy that even if I did an unbelievable extreme act of uh, religious piety by volunteering to sac sacrifice myself in flames, even that's no good. So, okay? Yes. The last book we're going to look at today is the book of 2 Corinthians, to the same people. Uh, what happened, apparently, is that when Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he had planted the church. Um, he had tried to grow them. They had all kinds of serious problems. He wrote to them. Apparently, the response that some of them had was to say, Who the heck do you think you are, Paul? You can't tell us what to do. Who, who put you in charge here? Okay, you're not the boss of me. <laughs> well, Paul writes back to them, defending his... Leadership, his apostleship. Paul always maintained that he was an apostle, which means a selected messenger and representative of Jesus Christ, because he did not become a, a, a believer through the witness of some other person, but rather through a personal uh, meeting or confrontation with Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. And Paul always maintained, I'm as much an apostle as Peter or John or any of the others, because just as they met Jesus and came to believe in him. I met Jesus on the road to Damascus and came to believe in him. So my credentials are just as good as theirs. So Paul defends his ministry and his message. He opposes the false teachers who had been speaking ill of him. And again, he admonishes the Corinthians to clean up their act. And as promised, they had promised that they were going to send money to help the poor church. There had been a famine in Judea. And the church in Jerusalem was especially suffering from that. You will remember most of the early converts, the Jewish converts, were very poor. Many of them had been slaves. Well, because there was a famine in Judea, they really needed help. And so various churches that Paul had planted, who were financially better off, had promised to help. 
Paul reminds the Corinthians that they had promised to help. In fact, there's a section in here, chapters 8 and 9 especially, that are called Paul's fundraising appeal. Because he does talk, and you know, Carolyn and I have both worked in raising money for Christian ministry before. That's part of what we've done. And we often would refer to 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 as being a good model for not being afraid to ask people to give to the things of God. Uh, and not being shy about that. And that being actually a godly thing. That it is giving to God and to the things of God when you contribute to the needs of the church or the, or the ministries of the church. All right? So it starts out, the first seven chapters are Paul's explanation of his ministry and his call and whatnot. The, the eight and nine are his collection for the saints, his fundraising letter. And then, chapters 10 to 13, he is giving a very vivid vindication of his apostleship. Again, this letter, more than anything else, is a defense of his right to have said all the things he said in the first letter. The indication is that Paul actually wrote as many as four letters to the Corinthian church because there is a reference in these letters and elsewhere about uh, two, it seems, at least two other letters that he wrote to this church which we don't have copies of. There are a number of places in scripture that they talk about, for instance, the, the, there's a reference to a letter being written to the church of Laodicea, which is one of the seven churches in the Revelation. We don't have that letter. So there are some other writings that were done at that time that have not come down to us. Um, the key verses in 2 Corinthians, and these are my ideas of key verses. You might find others that you think are most significant in these books. 2 Corinthians 4, 5, and 6 says, For we do not preach ourselves, but, Christ, but Jesus Christ as Lord. There's that Kyrios, that Lord again. And he's doing it in defense of his ministry. But Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out in darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. And then from 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 20. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men sin against them, and he was, has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Okay, any questions? Right. So I was taught many years ago on that first um, sentence of that second uh, verse where it said, um, the old has gone and the new has come. Mm -hmm. And I remember it as being, the old is gone and you are, be you are becoming new. Okay. In other words, it's not like a light bulb that's on and off. That means your salvation is, right. I think. But your life is becoming new, not it's a progressive. Test. Yeah, yeah, right. The idea that you work out your salvation with fear and trembling, kind of thing. In other words, you are saved, but now you are not fully immersed in that. You have not become all that God wants you to be as a, re as a result of your uh, salvation. It is a, it is an act of becoming a new creature. You are saved. You know, you are now right with God, but. You're still a child. You're still, you know, you're only, at first you only are ready for the milk of the gospel. You need to grow to the point where you're mature in the faith, that you can take on the meat of the truth. And so, yes, when you become a new creature, there is a progressive sense in that. Can you flip that one more? Yeah. Well, and I did have a, that's a good question. Sure. On the, um, where it says, uh, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Right. So this was referring to their morality. and right. A lot of people use that. I mean, and maybe it's, it's still true, but I think it's important to know the history of it. I mean, don't drink, don't chew, and don't go with girls that do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, you know, uh, eating too much, uh, yeah. smoking. Uh, That's an extrapolation. Yeah. In other words, that you should take care of your body, that you have a responsibility to be as healthy in your body as you can. I don't think that's an unreasonable extrapolation, but it's not the original context. The original context was one of uh, an issue of morality, of using your body immorally, and in that way polluting yourself. Okay, um, but I think that since then they talked about if your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, then you should take care of it. Yeah. But and, which again, I, I don't think is not va is not invalid, but it is it is an extrapolation from the original reference. Okay. Um, these are some images that I took uh, a few months ago in May from Corinth. They're kind of blurry because I blew them up so much. Um, this is the 
the Temple of Apollo, I think it is. Do I remember that correctly? Right? Temple of Apollo, what's left of it. That's not Delta, is it? No, this, this is Corinth. Oh, okay. um, this is the Agora of Corinth, and this is the, uh, the fortress up on top of this mountain. I can't imagine getting up there, but that's the, you can still see the, the broken walls of the forest. And then this was one of the fountain areas that was part of the Agora. And in, the, in Acts, you have Paul interacting with uh, the, the proconsul who was assigned there. There's a reference to Erastus, who uh, was a, the treasurer who gave money for a road. And we actually have a photograph where there's stones that Erastus' name is carved out in those. When we get into um, you know, some of the other books and stuff, we'll talk about some of that. But, but the ruins are still there today. And in your book, they're actually in, uh, that is in the maps book, there's a sort of a layout of the town what Corinth would have looked like, some of those rooms were still there. And in the study Bible, it was kind of fun for us when we got back from this trip, Carolyn and I could look at the map of like Philippi or Corinth, because they had maps in there, and go, oh, oh, we were right there, oh, oh, and then we're going down here. <laughs> it's very fun, so you should go. Um, any questions about Paul or Galatians, First and Second Thessalonians, First and Second Corinthians, anything? Suzanne. Just one, and it relates back to the time from um, Saul's, you know, seeing the Lord on conversion, the yes. conversion, uh, and then you said he went into the desert after he was healed, and then a few other things. But it wasn't until AD forty-seven he's actually writing. Was part of that time then spent there in Antioch at the church? <coughs> well, um, part of it is he, you know, he probably was converted around AD thirty-three or thirty-four, somewhere in there. Right after the time we said was the persecution of Stephen and when he was on his way to Damascus to persecute. He was in Damascus, he spent some time there, he went into the desert in Arabia apparently to pray and to you know, seek God's will, came back from Damascus. Um, there's a suggestion that he may have gone to Jerusalem once, um, but not in any official capacity. He comes back and goes up to Antioch, again, major center, center, and that's where Barnabas, who had heard about it, I mean, he starts preaching in Damascus. He already had started preaching. Um, but he was preaching kind of locally, Barnabas heard about him, and Barnabas went looking for him in Antioch and found him, and it was Barnabas that sort of brought him to Jerusalem and introduced him to everybody and said, you guys got to meet this guy. Uh, he used to be our hated enemy, but he really is one of us now, and you, you know, trust me, and Barnabas was one of the few they probably would actually have believed about that because everybody trusted Barnabas. And then back to Antioch, and then it was later that the first missionary journey. So there was a period in there, I um, mean, between the time that the first missionary journey um, we're looking at 12 or 13 years, probably, um, between the time that he was converted and the time that he actually started being active in terms of ministry. But we're told he was preaching in Damascus, and that the believers, not just Ananias, uh, Damascus, the first one who went to him, but others were having trouble believing that this really was the same God, because this is the Saul that persecuted us. And it was because he, he had, you know, people had heard of him, developed a little bit of a reputation in Damascus is why... Later on, Barnabas went looking for him in Antioch and found him and brought him back and introduced him to everybody. So, okay. Yes, Mark. It's interesting that the Lord found his 12 disciples amongst the fishermen and the tax collectors, kind of a ragtag, not particularly wealthy or educated. Right. But then when it came to Saul, he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, under Gamaliel, burned in his heart to serve his God, though he was serving in the wrong way. Right. You know, and he did special vision to him. and. Product of the exactly. I kind of need somebody like that for what yeah. I've planned. Yeah, um, if, if you're going to go out into the major cities in the civilized Greek world, being a fisherman from Galilee probably would not have been the best credential. Now, God could have still made that a success, but Paul was a very different kind of guy. A Roman citizen, well-educated, multilingual, um, you know, have, being trained in rhetoric so that he could speak. All of those kinds of things made him the ideal candidate for going to Corinth and Athens and you know Antioch, and Pisidia, and, and Ephesus and all these other places. So, and then yeah. I can just do that to Joseph and Moses and what after them and how yeah. to keep set up the people to do right. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Now, for those of you who are in the Wednesday class in theology, we are not meeting this week. Remember, I'm leaving right now to go to the airport. 